I have a bit of an interesting story for you guys today concerning an MP3 player that was released in the year 2000. This is an MP3 player that I owned when I was in high school. It is the Creative Nomad Jukebox, also known as the DAP Jukebox in Europe, the Digital Audio Player Jukebox. It's actually quite handsome, even today, for something that came out over 20 years ago. It's got a line-in port on the back, a couple of line-out ports, headphone jack on the side, and an IR receiver on the front. Now, the version that I owned was a six gigabyte model, which is what I believe this guy right here is. I know there was a 20 gigabyte model that was released as well. I'm not sure about any other capacities that came out. The storage was just massive for the time. MP3 players were the hottest new thing, and these things cost a pretty penny. They were not cheap at all. I have no idea how I justified a purchase like this way back then. I had a side hustle going on where I was repairing computers, selling used computers and things like that. And I remember saving up for several months and eventually picking this guy up. So fast forward 20 years, I'm shopping on eBay, looking for broken consoles, just buying some stuff for the channel. And I thought about the Nomad Jukebox, did a quick search on eBay, and there are dozens and dozens of them for sale. And most of these guys are listed as not working. They're being sold for parts. I picked this one up for about 20 to $30, where examples that did work were around the $100 range. Now, this is all kind of the first half of this project. I bought this in January of this year, so about nine months ago now. It arrived, sure enough, it didn't power up, but I just couldn't find anything wrong with it. And I kind of just shelved the project. A few months ago, I picked this thing back up and I started doing a little bit more research about why it might not be powering on to see if I could make a little bit more headway and get this guy up and running. And that's how I met Stefano Bassi. He's based out of Italy. He's a very skilled technician, the real kind, not the YouTube kind. And uh, he's figured out a solution to all these nomads that have the same no power issue. And he sent me a few chips that he's programmed himself in an effort to help me resurrect my nomad jukebox. So this is how part two of this project began to take shape. What I initially thought was not a particularly interesting repair, maybe a broken power jack, maybe a faulty voltage regulator is looking like it's probably a lot more nuanced than I was expecting. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop some batteries in this guy. So I got some new batteries right here. And to power it up, we just hit the center button right here. and absolutely nothing. No hard drive spin, completely dead. Now, for the sake of being thorough, let's go ahead and try it with a power supply as well. This guy right here is what I refer to as the poor man's power supply. It's a DC-DC buck converter. You can get these on Amazon for about five bucks. You can feed it any voltage from any old power supply that you have lying around. I think this one's from an old LCD monitor or something like that. And it's gonna let me step the voltage down to the desired level. We need 12 volts center positive for the Nomad. Right now it's set to 9.8. And if we manipulate this potentiometer, we can step it up to 12. 12 volts. Perfect. Now it needs to be center positive. So I need to make sure that I wire negative to the outside. Multimeter in continuity mode. And we'll just touch this on the outside and we'll see whether it's the solid or striped wire. It is the solid wire. So we need to make sure that we wire solid to the negative side of the output. Now, batteries are out. Let's go ahead and plug this guy in and see if there's any difference. Completely dead. Okay. All right, guys, let's go ahead and open this guy up. I'm gonna be referring to some documentation that Stefano sent my way on how to diagnose what's wrong with these nomads. So for all the steps that follow, I won't be using batteries. I'm just gonna be feeding it power through the DC jack. Now this unit's got two screws missing, but there's three holding it together. All right, let's separate the two halves. Okay. And this guy should just pop out of the shell. Perfect. So this is what the board looks like. Just a standard 
ID hard disk. And we have a bunch of components on the other side as well. All right, so I have Stefano's instructions up on the screen. Uh, he's giving me permission to share his work with you guys. So anything that I overlay on the screen, you guys will find it in the video description below. So I'm on page one of his guide and basically we're doing a bunch of voltage checks around the front side of the board. So I think the first thing we need to do is take out the hard disk. Let's go ahead and slide this guy out. Okay, we'll just set that aside. So the first thing we need to do is verify voltage at the source. So let's plug this guy in. What was that? Make sure not to lose these. There's four standoffs underneath the hard disk. Let's try that again. The big first step is to make sure that the board is completely energized and voltage is reaching everywhere that it's supposed to. So the way that he does that is by checking voltage at all the capacitors, so both on the front and on the back. All right, so let's start with the ones that are right next to the power circuit. Let me see if I can just use this random screw hold as ground, and we're expecting one volt on this first capacitor up here. Getting about 0.7 at the first capacitor. Let's try this guy down here. So we should be getting just under nine volts. I'm getting almost 12 volts. So I think I know what's going on. He's using a nine volt power supply and I'm using a 12 volt power supply. I suspect that the system just regulates it down to nine anyway. So let me change this to nine volts so that our readings match with the guide over here. Let's turn this guy down to nine. Okay, and that's nine volts. All right guys, so now things should make a little bit more sense. Let's see, up here, 8.9. That's good. To the left here, 8.8. .8. That's close enough. We should be getting nothing over here. That's good. 3.3 .3 over here. Perfect. And the rest of these should also read zero while the system is powered off. Nothing. Nothing. Pretty much nothing. Perfect. Now, if we try and power the system on, these two capacitors should read five volts. So let's try it with this guy right here. And we get five volts. How about this guy right here? Five volts when powered on, that's good. And this guy was reading zero when off, it should be 3.3 .3 when it's on, 3.3. .3. It's pretty much the same story on the reverse side of the board. I've gone ahead and just checked the rest of these off camera and uh, we're getting a voltage drop across pretty much all these capacitors within the expected range when the play button is depressed. So the board is energized, the system's trying to power up, but something very fundamental is broken to where there's absolutely nothing on the screen and when the hard drive is connected, there's no spin up or attempt to boot up. So we're done with the first big step and we've eliminated that there are really any power issues with the board and uh, the capacitors don't really look like a likely failure point either. Now, the next couple of sections require the use of an oscilloscope and I unfortunately do not own one just yet. There are four crystals on the motherboard and here's one right here. And the guide suggests measuring the frequency to make sure that they're all still working. Now, the third step requires taking readings on the data and address lines of this BIOS chip right here, this chip that says Antel. In Stefano's guide, there are some really excellent pictures on what you should be getting on those data and address lines so that you know whether this chip is the problem or not. Now, while I wasn't able to follow his instructions step-by-step step for these two sections of the guide, I did ask Stefano to send me a BIOS chip, and that is what he programmed and sent over. Now, the reason that I'm kind of taking a gamble on this being an issue without being able to reproduce the square waves in Stefano's guide is because the data sheet on this particular chip suggests that it has a 20 year data retention life cycle. And that means that the manufacturer of this chip essentially guaranteed that 
the data that engineers put on it would be good for 20 years, but after that, it was no longer guaranteed. And we are well past that 20 year mark. I don't think when Creative designed this MP3 player, they expected anyone to still be using it 20 years later. So they probably thought it was just gonna be e-waste by this point. So let's go ahead and take a look at the replacement chips that Stefano programmed and sent over. And there they are. And they're in this little anti-static bag inside this protective shell. So they have safely made the journey from halfway across the world. The reason that I asked him to send me three chips instead of one is because this is really fine soldering work. I've never soldered something this tiny. It's really going to test the limits of my skills and what I think I'm able to do with a soldering iron or hot air rework station. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. All right, guys, I'm all set up. I have the hot air and the iron ready to go. And I've pretty much taken out all the bells and whistles in order to maximize my odds for success. Let's start off by using some Kapton tape to cover the adjacent components and the hard drive connector as well so that we don't melt the plastic. Okay, the board is all taped up. Now, if some of that comes off while I'm working, it's not really a big deal. Most importantly, the hard drive connector, which is plastic, is completely wrapped up. Time for some chip quick. This is a low melt alloy. It's gonna help me extract the chip without ripping any pads. It's the name brand stuff. It's pretty expensive. I don't use it often, but it definitely has its place in your toolkit. It comes with its own flux. Let's go ahead and apply some to the legs of the chip. This stuff is very brittle, and uh, I found that when I use it with an iron, you tend to waste a lot of material because it likes sticking to the tip of your iron. So I'm going to just use my hot air station to weld it into the legs of the chip. I can always use some more if I need it. Hot air station is set to 350, fan speed 4. We are starting low and slow. So I'll give this a moment to heat up and we'll try and remove the chip. All right, we can see that the chip quick is completely molten. So we'll just keep warming this up for another 30 seconds or so and try and nudge the chip to see if it's ready to release. Beautiful, could not have asked for a better extraction. Now, if we compare the replacement chips that Stefano sent over, you will notice that it is a fair bit larger than the original chip. They no longer make these Amtel chips in this package size, but conveniently, the designers of the Nomad Creative have an alternate set of connection points for the same BIOS package. So it looks like they perhaps considered using a larger package, but ended up deciding to use the smaller one. But when I retin these pads, I'm going to clean everything up, but I'm only going to retin this side right here and this side right here that was not being used previously when we install the replacement BIOS chip. Now, before I forget, I want to mark the orientation of the chip. So you guys will notice that there's a small divot in that top right hand corner there. And that was this corner right here facing the CPU. So when we install the new chip, we want to make sure that it is oriented in the same way. So I'll just put a little marker here so I don't forget. Okay, time to clean up these pads. When I use braid, I like to cut it into small pieces and hold it with a set of tweezers. It'll help you use a lot less material. You'll be able to use the entire length of the braid 
and it's not going to burn your fingers because you're going to be holding it with a pair of tweezers. Iron is set to 350. All right, nice clean tip. Let's do this. All right guys, I'm gonna wick the pads again, this time after tinning them with some leaded solder, just to make sure that we get all of that chip quick off there. I'm going to remove some of this tape just to give myself a little bit more room. It has served its purpose. Pads are looking good and no ripped traces. Stefano's guide recommends using solder paste and a stencil to reattach the BIOS chip. I don't have either of those two things. so. I'm just going to try tinning the pads with some leaded solder and reseating it with a combination of the iron and some hot air. All right, let's retin the pads. A little bit of flux. Tin the tip. And I'm just going to very gently run it over the pads. Now the pads are tinned, one final cleanup, fresh flux, and then reattach the chip. We have that divot on the top right. All right, guys, let's start with a little bit of hot air, 350. And I just want to get the best alignment I can before I press it down. Might look into getting a microscope. All right, guys, the chip is barely tacked on there. I have to be careful. I'm going to go back in with an iron, but I think I got the alignment pretty good. All the pins look like they're properly lined up. Okay, let's go back in with the soldering iron. I'm just tacking the other side and then I'll go over everything once and for all. Little bridge there, I'm having a hard time clearing up. Just go back in with the braid. There we go. To my eye, I think these pins all look good, but we still have a bridge on the last three pins. So we'll have to go back in with a little bit of flux and clear that up. And how's it looking on this side? On this side, we have a small bridge here and a small bridge over here. I'm gonna go ahead and attach the narrow J-tip to try and clear up those solder bridges. All right, guys, let's get a little bit more flux on here. Right there and right there. Let's we'll start with that side. I think those are good. Now let's do this side. All right, I think that did it. Let's clean up and take a closer look. Those joints look really good to me.
it is time to test. So let's go ahead and plug this guy in and press the play button. All right. It works. Wow. It lives once more. And of course, it's asking for the hard disk, which we'll plug in and try out in a moment. I'm so proud of myself, guys. I mean, you have no idea. If you guys have been watching this channel for a little while and you kind of saw where I started and now to be able to solder in a chip like this without a microscope at that, my confidence is just through the roof. This is such a fun and useful hobby and you add a little bit of nostalgia to it and it's so special. I'm so excited. Stefano's guide does include instructions for swapping out the original hard disk with a compact flash card or even an SD card, but um, you can't just swap in another drive into these MP3 players. There is a proprietary bootloader that needs to be copied over from the original drive to the drive that you want to use uh, using some sort of hex editor like WinHex. I'd love to see if this drive still works, and if it does, um, hopefully there's some music on it. It'll be a time capsule of whatever the previous owner left on there. So let's go ahead and install it and take a look. All right, guys, let's go ahead and pop this guy back in the case just so that we can use the buttons and properly navigate the menu. I'll screw this guy back up in a moment. Let's just see if the hard drive actually works. Let's press play. Spinning up. So far the hard drive sounds healthy. It's not making any croaking or weird sounds. All right, so the last time this was used, these are the songs that were on the active playlist. Let me get a pair of headphones. Now I have to be careful about copyright strikes, so I'm gonna have to keep the volume very low, but just to test it out. Press play. Let's see what kind of music this person has on here. Let's go back to the library. I see, we have a jazz fan. Whoa. Blues. I'll be honest guys, I don't know much about jazz or blues. There could be hundreds of dollars of music on here, um, even a few thousand if it was purchased legitimately. Um, either that or someone really spent a lot of time modifying those mp3 tags and uh, anyone that had an mp3 collection back in the day, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, let's go into the EAX menu. I think there's a setting menu in here. Remember something like that. Yeah, system info. So that's the firmware version, last updated in 2002. And it looks like there's a 20 gigabyte hard disk in here. I didn't even pay attention to the hard disk label when we pulled it out, didn't even look at it. I was under the impression this was a six gigabyte model, but this is the larger 20 gigabyte model. That would have just been absolutely massive for 2000, 2001. And it looks like there's about 12 gigs of music on here. About eight gigs free. Almost 2000 tracks, 150 albums. So I probably will get the original um, nickel metal hydride batteries for this because it's rechargeable. You can just charge it with a power supply and with the included hard disk, you should get about five hours of playtime. And hopefully the battery circuit's working just fine. All right, batteries are good, awesome.
All right, guys, that's going to wrap this project up. I want to say a very big thank you to Stefano Bassi. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you sending all your work over to me and helping me fix this Nomad. I'm going to link all the files that Stefano sent me in the video description below. And um, if you have a faulty Nomad that doesn't power up, it is more than likely an issue with the BIOS chip. There are so many of these Nomads out there that have the exact same symptoms. And finally, someone has figured out what's plaguing all of these faulty nomads. So if you want a BIOS chip to fix your nomad, reach out to Stefano. He's a really nice guy, such a pleasure dealing with him. And uh, he's gonna be more than happy to send you a BIOS chip to fix your nomad. All right guys, that's all she wrote. Thank you very much. And I will see you guys again soon. Take care.